be calmed today. But I do have a few, uh, I'm thinking of Professor Keck, some preliminary comments if we're going until you know, 45 minutes into the class and then the last five minutes we get his lecture. Um, <laughs> I have some preliminary comments which are pretty much an ars poetica, pretty much a, a, a statement about um, how I view my own project. The reason for the two titles, um, I was thinking of Emily Dickinson and Emily Dickinson's fascicles She'll often have two poems written, one on top of the other. Not one in the margin, not an asterisk, not a, a struck out word, and, and then another word. But two poems, one on top of the other, um, as if to say, I want both of these words uh, in this space, in the line, at this moment, at once. Um, and that's the way I feel about poetry and theology. Uh, for me, they're correlative. Uh, they define the laws of the physical world by, again, existing in the same place at the same time or perhaps outside of time um, uh, for me. I should say, too, that it's a pleasure to speak with an audience for whom theology is an unquestioned source of engagement with the world and an unquestioned guide for, as Wallace Stevens says, how to live, what to do. Um, the privilege of having such an audience is not often my lot, so I'll try to reciprocate the exchange by illustrating how the so-called secular life of poetry functions as theology in my work and vice versa. Uh, a little sketchy to get me to the poem, so it might sound a little aphoristic, uh, but I hope you can follow it. Poetry sits on the ivory pedestal of the arts classic, biblical, ritualistic, historical. Even the most humble and seemingly unsophisticated citizen will turn to poetry during times of great need and great emotion, deaths, weddings, funerals, wars, births. During average days, poetry is seldom invited down to the party. Few poems grace office buildings. One seldom turns on public broadcasting to hear poetry, although performance poetry, spoken word, and some subway placards have lived in the situation. Many years ago, I heard a depressing statistic. 1% of the American public buys books regularly, and I think regularly was defined as once a month. Only 3% of that 1% buys poetry. Um, Poetry for most is forgotten by adulthood, along with paste and big cheap tablets and husky pencils. <laughs> poetry and theology are victims of similar critiques. They are unreadable, obtuse, pedantic, out of touch, irrelevant to the common day. Always the same damning label is used, hopelessly academic. Those adjectives for me describe poor theology and failed poems. Without an engaged audience, either pursuit is reduced to the private musings of the mind. The mind is a friend to poetry and theology, <laughs> but is not the source of either. Poetry and theology must share a partner in their respective enterprises, and that is the audience or the reader. The audience is intrinsic to the poetic and theological event, a co-creator of the thing itself. The audience should not be treated with disregard. Prayer, writes Simone Weil, is absolute, unmixed attention. Prayer is absolute, unmixed attention. And so is poetry. Both are joyfully and grievously, in the moment, all-consuming. And both direct the heart to the word. The word is the means to the divine end. And the word is not a signifier, but the thing itself. It is both vehicle and tenor at once. Passion for language is a creative force in both poetic and theological endeavors. Poetry, I assert, can help theology avoid the graves of cliché and old metaphors. Fixation on any image or fixture is idolatrous, 
and reminds us why grave and graven have similar roots. Poetry is fluid, ready to accept a new rhythm and a better phrase if either will further the cause of precision. As Richard Hugo writes, you owe reality nothing and the truth of your feelings everything. For our purposes, I would offer, you owe reality nothing because this reality is not the reality the theological poet is struggling to reach. Poetry strives for the clearest, most specific image. Poetry knows that metaphor is not a lesser reality, a poor substitute, as in, oh, that's just a metaphor. And paradoxically, poetry asserts itself as being part of the genre of fiction. Poetry is a made thing. No, the paradox of metaphor is the truth that it alone has access to the divine and that it can never fully grasp the divine. Still, it remains our best bet. In this way, poetry is sacramental. I await an essay by the poet Scott Cairns, who happens to be Greek, Greek Orthodox, on this matter. He gave an address at the Associated Writing Programs Convention last spring, in which he expressed confidence in the transubstantiated nature of poetry with greater eloquence than I ever have. But it feels uh, very much like he's speaking for me as well. Poetry does not mean, and it does not point, and it does not show. Poetry does not represent the thing. It is not symbolic of the thing. It is the thing itself. Its power is conjured between the audience and the poet. It is mysterious, respectful of silence. Without silence, like I have to tell you guys, without silence, there is no music. Without music, there is no poetry. Poetry is composed, after all. Poetry owes more to music and to sculpture than it does to prose writing. Poetry is shaped. Poetry sings. When it does not, its pedestal is easily passed by, by those who rightly know there's something better to which they can give their time. For me, there is no possibility of, of untangling the poetic and the theological impulse. Their vibrancy rests in the imagination, and they call us to rest in the imagination, not as an escape, but as a return home. I couldn't decide whether or not I was going to tell you this story. <laughs> but I'm, I'm feeling a little warmer in here, so I think I can tell it. Um, it's sort of odd where my musings, my current musings on the imagination um, got the most recent spark from. I was reading a spiritual autobiography, a pretty contemporary one, called Dharma Punks. Anybody know this book? Um, I want to say it was published maybe a year and a half ago, Harper's. And the author's name is Noah Levine. It's not a great book. It's not terribly well written. But it's interesting. Uh, he's writing about um, his youth and his discovering the punk rock movement and finding a lot of um, finding a lot of comfort and a lot of um, belonging in that movement. And actually, he never, he, even after he converts to Buddhism, he never um, gives that up. Punk rock music remains an important spiritual source for him. But, you know, a very, a very by the book conversion narrative is told, where he gets into drugs and starts stealing and fighting, and it, he ends up in a juvenile detention facility, which is where he converts to Buddhism. He continues to practice and to study, and at a certain point, a teacher tells him, and he's just at, I think, maybe 19 at this point, a teacher tells him, Noah, to, to go any further in your development, you will have to give up sex. And he says, nothing. And the teacher says, you may continue to have sex with the women you're dating. You just have to give up your 
autoerotic activities. He's confused by this, and the teacher explains, when you fantasize, without someone's consent, you do violence to that person. Well, this blew me away when I read it, because after a few moments of getting through it, all the other thoughts I had about it, I was, <laughs> I was reminded of I was reminded of Matthew, and I was reminded of of Jesus saying, you know, if you get angry with your brother, um, it's not do not murder. If you get angry with your brother, this is the equivalent. Or um, you shall not commit adultery, but I say everyone who looks at a woman with lust in her heart commits adultery with her. Um, I thought about that, a text that I always found terrifying, and I thought most people would try to avoid preaching on, because it sounded to me like a call for, for just an impossible kind of perfection, um, uh, purity of, of even one's feelings, that somehow you're, you're uh, somehow my... Um, Self-control would have to precede my feelings. That just seemed impossible to me. But once I read this passage in Dharma Ponce, I thought perhaps Jesus was privileging the imagination in the way that Noah's teacher was privileging the imagination, saying, um, remember to honor your imagination. Remember that, let's see, how can I best put this? Um, remember that in developing your inner life, um, remember that developing your inner life is as important as developing your external actions. Um, and it was very, it was very helpful for me. I, I felt that I had um, come to some understanding about that text that could be more helpful to me. Um, and of course, you know, it's a very funny passage in the in the book, but um, I have to say, I think Noah at 19 got it, you know, long before I did, that um, the imagination matters, and that spiritual development uh, belongs in the imagination as much as it does in, um, in one's worship or one's actions or one's speech. So I told the, the punk rock story. Um, <laughs> Let me stop, though, and read you a few paragraphs as a means of introduction to my poems that I wrote for a talk last fall. And you'll understand when I get to the end why I'm reading you something that I wrote uh, a year ago. Here it is. I write poems set in my home of southern Louisiana. I grew up about 80 miles south-southwest of New Orleans in Lafouche Parish, a small town called Galliana. <clears throat> it's okay if you want to make a joke. I didn't know there was anything south of New Orleans. Um, <laughs> but for now, at least, for now, at least, there is. If we had the time, I could explain in proud detail the Cajun way of life, crawfish boils on Fridays and Lent. I, I never understood there was anything sacrificial about Fridays and Lent. Um, <laughs> The blessing of the fleet at the beginning of shrimp season, the oil industry's presence, the music, but most of all, the community. Cajun culture is about hospitality above all things. A paradoxical kind of hospitality, of course, because it brushes against a kind of clannish protection of extended families and native-born kin, even as it opens itself to care for visitors and transplants. There is the lingering cultural memory of a people cast out of Acadia in the 17th century for refusing to renounce their Catholic faith and to sign a loyalty oath to the King of England. Even for the Germans, the Italians, and the Poles, incorporated into Cajun culture, this perpetual sense of loss exists and is partly manifested in the live-in-the-moment joy of family and community celebrations. Why am I telling you this? Well, because I'm nostalgic for the days, I could have riffed on and on about this rare place in this country, a community with its own language, cuisine, music, 
dance, architecture, folk religion, philosophy, and not have had to tell you I could very well outlive my hometown. Even without a major hurricane, I'm still reading from this past piece, but you know, I want to say a hurricane like Rita. Um, even without a major hurricane, a hurricane like Ivan, which barely missed us, the Gulf is eating my home state so fast, 25 or 45 square miles a year. The next generation will certainly be growing up without the communities I knew. Environmentalists can tell you about the impact to migrating birds and other marshland inhabitants. Business people can tell you to eat all the crab you can now, because so-called Maryland crab is Louisiana crab. And the crab industry in Louisiana is facing extinction. Even oil executives who dredge canals through the marsh, exponentially increasing coastal erosion, who sped the destruction with help from fertilizer runoff in the Mississippi River, and a disastrous levee project to protect the saucer that is New Orleans, those executives will tell you that a third of our domestic oil flows through a major port, Port Fouchon, threatened and sinking. A few miles from Port Fouchon is a bridge, not higher than a hill around here, but in the flat marsh of Louisiana, from that bridge, one can get a fairly long view. You can see lakes where just when I was in high school, not so long ago, <laughs> there was land. You see the remains of a cemetery dropping into the brackish water, one cement vault at a time. Gray crosses and the gaping holes where bodies were exhumed are visible at low tide. Here, here ends the reading from, <laughs> from <the end>. <laughs> <laughs> Today, because of the media coverage of Katrina's devastation, you probably understood more of this context than my audience last year. You have heard much about the polluted Mississippi, the faulty levying, and the American entitlement to cheap gas that has destroyed southern Louisiana. But for my part of the state, an estuary of 600,000 people, the big one has not hit, at least not now. Katrina took a last minute easterly jag, which we thought spared New Orleans, but did spare my hometown somewhat. The irony here, is that the levees meant to save New Orleans while killing the marsh ended up trapping New Orleans because the marsh was not there to absorb some of the floodwaters and weaken the winds. Bureaucrats, for at least 80 years, toyed with the lives of others and sacrificed the powerless for the hubris of the few. In my poetry, I've been borrowing shamelessly from Simone Bates' writings on decreation. The dissolution of the land as metaphor for the dismantling of the self, which for they is a necessary suffering to achieve union with the divine. Because despite my impulse to educate and urge people to change, I'm an elegist and I know it. What I write about is already gone. So the poems I'm about to read may sound eerie, but I assure you, all of them were written years ago. The topic is not new, and the context of my work is not unique. In most cases in these poems, the land and the people serve as vehicles for theological longing. These are the sounds and colors of my home in the immediacy it still holds for me, a present tense paradox of old and new, abundance and loss. I'm going to start with a couple older poems from Cote Blanche and then read some new poems, but of course new is. You know, am I? All of these poems, all of the new poems are not years old. There's one that I wrote in about June, but I'll tell you which one that is. All the others are, <coughs> are several years old. The first poem is titled, As If There Were Only One. Shameless borrowing is not something I'm afraid of. <laughs> In the morning, God pulled me onto the porch, a rain-washed gray and brilliant shore. I sat in my orange pajamas and waited. God said, look at the tree, and I did. Its leaves were newly yellow and green, slick and bright, 
and so alive it hurt to take the colors in. My pupils grew hungry and wide against my will. God said, listen to the tree, and I did. It said, live, and it opens itself wider, not with desire, but the way I imagine a surgeon spreads the ribs of a patient in distress and rubs her paralyzed heart. Only this tree parted its own limbs toward the sky. I was the light in that sky. I reached into the thick, sweet core, and I lifted it to my mouth and held it there for a long time until I tasted the word, tree, because I had forgotten its name. Then I said my own name twice, softly. Augustine said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us, but I hadn't believed him. And God put me down on the steps with my coffee and my cigarettes. And although I still could not eat nor sleep, that evening and that morning were my first day back. I'll try to tell you what I know. Sometimes it's so hot, the thistle bends to the morning dew, and the limbs of trees seem so weighted, like they won't hold up moths anymore. The women sit and swell with the backwash of old family pain, and won't leave the house to walk across the neighbor's yard. One man takes up a shotgun over the shit hosed from a pen of dogs. One boy takes a fist of rings and slams the face of a kid throwing shells at his car. That shiny car is all the love his father has to give. And his mother cooks the best shrimp etouffee, and every day smokes three packs down to their mustard-colored ends. One night, the finest woman I ever knew pulled a cocktail waitress by the hair out of the back seat of her husband's new El Dorado Cadillac and knocked her down between the cars at the Queen Bee Lounge. She drove the man slumped and snoring with his hand in his pants home, and not a word was said. I'll try to tell you what I know about people who love each other, and the fear of losing that cuts a path as wide as a tropical storm through the marsh, and gets closer each year to falling at the foot of your door. I mean, this should be, you know, dedicated to the spirit of Peter Hawkins. He was my advisor when I was here. I don't know if I ever showed him this poem. I probably shouldn't, right? Don't show a, a Dante scholar a Dante poem. Um, it's after uh, Canto 11, Dante's Inferno, and it's titled Hell, Late 20th Century. <laughs> In the second ring, called despondence. We sit cross-legged and turn our gloomy hearts on a spit. The change is luminous. We find figures of joy in blue flames, hold the forearms we'd scarred to our chest, and count embers like falling grains. When ice flows to reverse our pain, we breathe in cool fog until our flesh grays. It could be worse. Memories of the lost world surface as palm-shaped bruises on cheekbones. Beaches we walked, steely and gazeless. Bright fruit we ignored or ate with no taste. Sharp winter days we groped past or slept through. And that retriever who chased us from bed to bath, carrying ball, then bone, in adoration. We reach into yellow vapor, touch nothing and scratch the air of her head and ears. This is the last one I'll read from a good blush. It's called um, Conversion. The tracks got ripped up like a busted zipper. 
thrown down piles of tar and broken ties into the dead grass on the bayou side. You have to understand, only time tears things down here. Long after you quit a house, pack up and leave, that house stands cataloged under sheets of rust, painless, porchless, for years. Cast iron kettles won't move, won't be moved. The air above their bellies still and sharp. No one remembers the cane they boiled or how they came to kill grass where they do. Half an old bridge makes a sweet fishing spot but taking the rails away, it was an insult, really, a theft. I saw how one loss collapses into another, the rings between them almost indistinguishable. But then to the right of the road, the shoulder left with sunflowers, the blue sky dangled like a scarf, and the part of me that was buried came back like the dead after hard rain, just pushed up the glass lid, and stepped onto solid ground. Backwater rises to its own schedule, covers the highways. You can't tell the bayou's banks from the road's edge. And then there's no question of staving off conversion. Even the dead won't be held down. feel like saying, I'm really not that nervous, I'm just really cold. <laughs> um, here's the poem I lied about. I thought everything in here was a couple years old, but I wrote, I wrote this poem at the beginning of the summer. And it's not per se a Louisiana poem, but then I think all of my poems are Louisiana poems, even if they're set someplace else. <laughs> this is titled Creation, and it's, it's a divine address. I either use or capitalize. <laughs> Creation. From the beginning, we knew you were a mud dauber. That we have to look for you under the eaves. That you'd be so intent on your crude grottos, you wouldn't perceive our scrutiny. And of course, later, you would come spiraling down, stinger first, your inadequate warning so much like everything we make. An idle hum an idle motor, softer than the gentle hummingbird who passes by your clay cells in search of something blue, something unambiguous, whose flames destroy, destroy and keep us warm. I don't know what will happen to that poem, but I just really like saying, you were a mud dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what will happen to it. It's called The Water, and um, there's this line in it about a brother-in-law, and when I read it, you'll hear it. And so, it was published recently, and I had to call my sister. This is the kind of stuff you think you would have to do, and I had to say, listen, I think you might see this poem. And I just want you to know this is a generic brother-in-law. This isn't necessarily so-and-so. Although it really is. So <laughs>
In the afternoon, the water is there, only more. Browner and grayer, no sweeping seaweed or foam, just its presence farther up your shore. Like a dull brother-in-law in front of TV, he means something to somebody, but not you, not just now. <laughs> its slow wake seems harmless, the litany of waves before a storm rolling benignly ashore, intoxicating. And then it is there, all gray length of it, rich sex of it. It wants you so badly, it pounds at the door. Let me take your smallness, your jetties, your broad coasts, your loam. It gathers at night beyond the curtain of mosquitoes, darker than the shut down sky, the boarded up clouds. Its desire thrums like an idling outboard. Ignore it, and it tows itself into your dreams. It's everywhere, every chance, all the time. It is more certain than death or love. It must have been conceived by death and love. When the last silt sinks under your feet, you will have to walk out on this water. It wasn't so bad. It was just a little moment. But you never know. You never know. Uh, this is, this is a, I just came from the contemporary poetry class. This is sort of an extension of the discussion with my class, but um, in, in the Code Blanche is this poem, there's this mention about how nobody in my family, my mother's family, can swim. They're all Sicilian, and they weren't allowed in the pool during the war because they were Italian. The pool was owned by the Knights of Columbus. I know, don't even say anything, but that's how it was. And so I had this little mention of this in this poem. You would have thought that I had like taken out members of our family and machine gunned them because I had said this thing about the Knights of Columbus. Of course, nobody in my, nobody in my mother's family of course, belongs to the Knights of Columbus because they're good Sicilians and they don't forget. Um, <laughs> so I didn't really understand why I had done this terrible thing, but that was really just like one line, you know. Can't you take that poem out? <laughs> so you, so it's a word to myself, you just never know, and that's why above your desk you tag Gertrude Stein's quotation, one writes for oneself and for strangers. <laughs> This one is titled, The Dirty Side of the Storm. Death just misses you. Its well-defined eye and taut rotation land on someone else. No need to study the sky for signs or watch the cows, not with satellite loops, infrared imagery, recognizant flights, shrinking the orange cones of uncertainty. If it makes you feel better, go ahead and push pins through a brittle chart. Your coordinates square neatly east of the worst wind shear, lightning strikes, and bursts of air. All convection steers clear of your splattered doorframe. The Red Cross mobilizes elsewhere. Take a good look at those oak roots from a calm doorstep and wait. The sadness is a surge carrying all its debris back to you. A flood that shoves claws of ants and snakes through your walls and then sits in your house for days and days. This is the dirty side of the storm. Would the death had blown straight through. I mentioned the, um, that graveyard in Leeville, I didn't mention the place, but it's Leeville, Louisiana, that the water has just sort of taken over this graveyard and the graves are slowly falling in. And the bodies are exhumed and they're in this new graveyard, you know, like an eighth of a mile away. How long is that going to last? But, um, <laughs> but what's not in the poem, and actually this is terrible because I'm going to tell you a story I think it's more interesting than the poem, it, is that when you, if I took you to see this, this graveyard in the water, People would be fishing there because the fish hide in the tombs. Oh. It's made a nice little artificial reef. Now there are no bodies there anymore, but it's just kind of weird to see, you know, 
People just <laughs> fall on all these graves, but that's what you can see. And I, was, I was just home a couple weeks ago, and those those graves are still there. They're, you know, more in the water or whatever. They're more submerged, but they're still there. And, and after this next storm passes, people are going to be fishing. And it's, it's more interesting than the poem, I'm afraid. <laughs> This is titled, The Burial at Sea, Leadville Cemetery, Louisiana. They must have heard it coming, the relentless marsh water throwing itself against their walls, salt heavy and exhausted day after day, the old bricks warmed in the noon sun. It must have sounded like regret, like a bunkmate's throaty grinning, getting louder and closer as the deckhands roll from sleep. It must have set the marsh struggling, high tides, long, muddy arms that lift bodies into a bath or onto the quilted gulf. It must have kept them company, the persistent lapping, the slow rock down. When one holds still, the world's rough motions calm into shining ripples. They must have been comforted that change is possible for the dead. This last poem, I couldn't even pretend is set in Louisiana, um, because the title, Witness Tree, anybody from the Northwest? Do you know what a witness tree is? I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> You're in my class. You know what a witness tree is? Um, <laughs> a wit <laughs> places where, um, wooded places, um, this is specifically Oregon. Uh, you'll look along a hillside and it's one tree, you know, much, much taller than the rest. And that tree has been designated as a boundary marker by the Forestry Service. And, you know, the, the warning on it is, yeah. we'll, we'll hunt you down, we'll kill your children, we'll burn your village if you cut down this tree. And so, wherever, um, wherever there's been logging, those trees have been left. And so, it's, um, they're very interesting. That's where the title of this, this poem comes from. Witness tree. To the right of the altar, Joan of Arc, shorn and shielded and very much alive. How surprised I would have been as a child to see her lashed to tree branches instead of wielding her blade over the front pews, over Mary's votive stand. Mary, determined and confident, her cloak parted to shelter the roses and beads of the vulnerable. Now when the priest's lips press against the marble altar, I see how we love blood spilled best. What moves in us, we distrust. Corrupted flesh confirms our deepest knowledge, our mouths aching for the relics we become. In the forest cathedral, the firs refuse to still, pulsing on the hillside, chanting even as the brush below them smolders and the fields settle in a deep red brow. How small the bloodshed must look to the witness tree from its vantage on the ridge, its maroon stripes only paint warning loggers away. Still it notes every gesture in its rings, tastes acrid smoke from the fires below, recognizes the faces in the fields, dogs that chase elk, those that lie down in the dust and are welcomed on some other hill it alone sees. Vision without sacrifice, the tree that cannot be felled, stronger and greener, that breathes in death and joy with disinterest and breathes out life and more life. Thank you.